the first time I saw the movie we were talking about today was actually because uh, my local theater, for one and only time ever, did a double feature. And it was the weirdest double feature. It better because this, movie, this movie's part of it. We all wanted. We all went to see the first movie, which was Zack Snyder's remake of Dawn of the Dead. Okay. And then this was the B track, uh, Taking Lives from DJ Caruso. So uh, we all stayed throughout the movie. Um, I know one or two of us really hated it, and I remember when the movie finished, I was like, I don't know if I liked that or not. And then strangely enough, three months later, I went and bought it, and it sat on my shelf for fifteen years uh, until until today. Where we get to talk about it finally. <laughs> All right, uh, we're talking about taking lives, and it's, I think it's gonna take us too. Welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothy from GoFilmReviews.com. Hey, I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks again for watching. Thanks again for finding us, and for our loyal fans, thank you for to continue support the show. Where uh, you can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. We do have a Patreon. Check that out for some great deals. Today we're going to talk about another uh, murder mystery. One of those whodunits. Yeah, kind of felt bit, in line um, with uh, like kiss the girls and all that. Kind yeah, of stuff. Like, I was uh, seeing uh, the Bone Collector because we have our we have our like Angelina Jolie. Jolie. <laughs> in that kind of a genre, yeah. Angelina was she in that too? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk about taking lives. Uh, FBI profiler Elena Scott has been recruited by Montreal police to hunt a serial killer who assumes the identities of his victims. The police finally have a lead with a museum employee who has seen the killer's face and lived, but can they find him before he strikes again? Now, does this movie get in your brain again because Paul Daniels in this as a bad guy? I can't honestly tell you why. Was it subconsciously? Movie? Just I didn't realize that he was, but maybe it was subconsciously. <laughs> After watching the Batman, and they're like. And, was, and then I've never seen this movie, so yeah. I watched it. And was like, this is Paul Dano, and this is Dano doing bad things. And like, did you watch Batman? Like, Paul Dano doing bad. I honestly things? can't tell you why I thought of this. Maybe it was because of the just the, the like rediscovery resurgence of a lot of Ethan Hawke genre pictures because he's yeah. been very prestige for the last couple of years. Seeing him doing something now like Moonlight or Moon Moon Knight, Moon Knight. or, or uh, Marvel yeah. might have triggered me into this movie. <laughs> um, I don't really know. To be honest, I can't tell you why I thought of it. I just thought of it. Um, and hey, I, anyway, I, it's a start like a, not really like rabbit, but you start with a crash. Yeah, I you actually think the a... opening of the movie is great. Yeah. I, think, I think it's downright great. I think you've got uh, strong performances. You have, I remember being in the theater and seeing the shocking moment. And it's almost like a did that really happen kind of a moment. And yeah, even Paul Daniels here is like, did that really happen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was I was taken by that moment, and that's maybe one of the key reasons why this film has stayed with me. <clears throat> I also think that uh, we have the search for the killer. There's a couple of redirects that I was like blown away by, and again, 14 year old Kyle didn't see a lot of these movies, so maybe I wasn't blown away by him the second time. But there's yeah. a couple of movements that you get because. We get, uh, you know, I guess spoilers abound. We're only going to talk about this because there's a lot of spoilers in it. Kiefer Sutherland is in the movie for about three minutes. Very yeah. few lines of dialogue. So I think he was doing 24 when this came out. He was doing, yeah, the fourth season of 24 was airing. And he, he also... He's also a record producer. Yeah. Well, he, he'd also just done Phone Booth, where he was Bukhara barely Farrell. visible in the film, had a voice performance for most of it. And so it, it kind of felt like right that he was our, our assumed killer when he shows up. He, if you didn't really know, he had a little bit of a dip in the early 2000s. He had a little pe friction with yeah. people, working with people. So he's trying to rejuvenate his career a little bit by peppering into movies, not really yeah. highlighting him. And this is one of those that... And I'm sure that 24 was a very grueling filming schedule. Um, oh, yeah. For the fact that he did uh, eight seasons and then the limited series and a movie for like the fact that he was doing as much of that as he was, that seemed like a lot of work because he was heavily featured in every single episode. Um... And they did 24. You can't do less. So he was probably very busy. I think 24 got his career back on track. And then he was yeah. able to kind of just sneak away for like a day of recording in a booth for phone booth. And like a day of doing an action scene in this movie. Like he probably only had limited time. And he does make good use of that time, I think. He has limited screen time in a lot of movies during that time period. And he's effective. Um, it's just I think some of this movie gets into downright silly territory. <laughs> I, I, can, I have to say for this first time watching, I was a little bit, I have to say, bored. <laughs> <laughs> that it's it's absolutely 20 minutes too long um, and I know this always comes down to like a good movie is never is never too short a bad movie well, is never too long well you had to we knew it had to because if you have an interrogation scene you know you're going to have to have that come back it's a mm -hmm. callback you need a, 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 the reverse of the interrogation scene that's true 
and yeah, especially for writing. And I was like, they're gonna have to do this at the ending. And like I said, I went to cold. I didn't. I knew about this movie. I just avoided it because mm. everybody. It's one of those things that everybody liked to talk about, and you're like, you like murder mysteries, you should see this. And when everybody tells you to do something, I'm almost most more reluctant to do it. Mm. And so I kind of avoid it, and then I can lost it, lost it in the ether. Yeah. <laughs> and then you talk about it, it's like, oh yeah, that movie. Great. Yeah. We'll there's talk. there's just there's so many parts of it that that I felt that work really well, but then there's equally enough parts that don't that make an overall messy experience. And going into yeah. it with like messy. Um, yeah. This was the first DJ Caruso film I'd seen. I became a huge fan of Disturbia, his movie. I thought Eagle Eye was quite good. Um, but then he also recently did this movie, Redeeming Love, that was uh, just in theaters a couple months ago that I thought was downright terrible. So, like, I'm very hit or miss on DJ Caruso as a director. Uh, this is one for me that he knocks it out of the park in certain elements. Um, I was shocked by some of the reveals that were there. But then it's just, just some wasted time in the narrative where we're spending time on things that don't feel necessary. We introduce Elena Scott, played by Angelina Jolie. She's supposed to be an FBI profiler. You're a good enough FBI profiler to be brought in by Montreal police. Okay, so that means you must be really good. By yourself. Yeah. And then they proceed to make her make some of the dumbest choices that a profiler would make. Um, which is different from what I really like is Wind River, which kind of did the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Which has, yeah, the, like, we bring Even though she's not smart. a really good profile, she's just one of the worst ones. Yeah. And you just throw it off to, like, we don't give a crap. But I believed every choice, and she made yeah. and, and she made in smarter choices in Wind River as a newbie right. <laughs> than Elena Scott does in this movie. And she's supposed to be good. She's supposed to be really good. It's her, like, home's good. Yeah. Where she, and, and part of the way is, like, she starts off when they introduce her, like, they give her this small little moment where she's able to, like, rifle off all these things she can figure out about the killer just from the moment she has there. And I was like, okay, cool. She's she's really smart. She has that, yeah, Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot, like being able to derive anything from a pebble. And then she, as she gets invested in this with her interactions with Ethan Hawke, she makes the dumbest choices. <laughs> and right. I think all of it was done, like parts of it were just like, hey, we need a nude scene. So we're going to have her her bang the person that well, she probably shouldn't that's trust. What I, it immediately popped in my brain that family guy. Yeah? Oh, this is a bad movie. Can we have a nude scene? And Angelina's like, yeah, okay. We got a movie here. We got a movie. <laughs> yeah. Ethan, you're going to be nude with Angelina. Oh, no. I'm going to be nude with her? No. No. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. darn. You know what? And I think uh, maybe part of my 14-year-old Kyle might have thought that was necessary in the film. But uh, Kyle in his 30s is like, why would she make a foolish choice like this? Um, I just, yeah. There's so many things about her character. She'd be smart enough to say, I want to I'm compromised. You need to bring somebody else. Yep. She'd be smart enough to say that and then do a peripheral kind of stay on even though she's officially off the case yeah think, like switchback maybe yeah i think if you mix in a little bit of switchback to this movie a little bit like wind river you've mm. got a great script i think they have a great concept oh I yeah i think that's what happens is when you write characters smarter than yourself you get lost in it a little bit that's true too and you gotta um, kind of remember, remember you can't you're not you're right you know you gotta be not as clever as the characters yeah yeah and i think like yeah we introduced ethan hawk as costa um, who's this museum employee who's who's seen the killer and lived? I thought it was clever because he's not always he's not really lying about anything. He's kind of just like not saying all the details. It's a clever idea for a character, but when they introduce him, he's got an ID on the screen, and I'm confused about how they would have his photo ID on the screen if spoiler alert, he's our killer. <laughs> so how do they? How did he infiltrate? Like, I, I wanted I to have a scene with that. If we're if we're gonna go there and we're gonna make him some sort of mastermind where he can like hack into government things, yeah. sure. But then show me how that happens because I didn't buy it. And that's maybe the most frustrating thing is that they didn't think anyone would care to rewatch and see it. <laughs> the next step is I'm gonna uh, tell him Mr. Ripley, mm -hmm. somebody that's you know a psychopath but is able to be under the radar, but doesn't really have all the thread together, but is able to keep it at bay being really truly kind of caught yes yeah. and they introduce him as a you know matt damon in that film they introduce as someone who's able to think in the moment yeah um and he's our focus so we spend more time in his head yeah. in that movie there's an equal amount of he's really clever and he's also pretty lucky and they they acknowledge that he's lucky in a couple but moments but he doesn't like, want to be himself yeah which this ethan hawk character is that kind of the same exactly so like they're they're similar but in the same way like i don't buy that ethan hawk's character is smart enough to move through this situation yeah. i bought matt damon as, as yeah. ripley that's the big conceit is that again like smart writing makes a smart character 
uh, jumping the shark in your narrative focus makes an Ethan Hawke costume character. Right. Ethan Hawke's better than that. <laughs> um, there's a, I want to bring this up because we'd like to talk about psychopaths. And then one of the things that we usually, especially with Writer's Workshop, we always think smart, psychopath means you're really super smart, like mm -hmm. you're uh, super intelligent. Yeah. But the, one of the things we know about uh, at this TED Talk is Dr. Jim Fallon talks about it, and you can find it. Jim Fallon talks about psychopathic brains. Is one of the traits is, and we like it about it, psychopaths cannot shut up. Mm -hmm. And they'll love, they'll love the talk. And that's one of the things they had taught with Ethan Hawke. Even though he knows he's getting away with it, he can't shut up. Yeah. And that's one of the things we know about psychopaths. Even like the Joker. He can't shut up. No, I'm not going to shut up. Right? Yeah. They get that yeah. part right with him. And, and yeah. they get a guy who's, who's I guess charismatic. They get that right. Yeah. You know, uh, Ethan Hawke is a great actor who can pull the most out of the least. You know, I think you can, you can think put so. him in movies where, where there's not much for him to do, and he will find a way to persist. And that's and one I of the things that's what he does yeah. here. Um, yeah. I liked his performance. I did. I liked, no, and I liked how he was able to switch on a little. Like I said, I, I can picture the movie not being all that great with Ethan Hawke in it, but I can't picture him being bad in it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, maybe that's that's going back to like the central problem is that there's a great concept, and I believe this is based on a book by yeah Michael Pye. Yeah. There's probably a great book. It's just he in that eat. adaptation of making that book into a movie, it feels like some steps were taken to trim down the narrative, which has to happen. I get it. But I feel like they sacrificed too much of the believability yeah. that we have to form because this is an unbelievable story. What I think they want to do with, the, with these two characters of Angelina Jolie's character and Ethan Hawke's character is what happens when you believe you are the smartest person in the room, you will get discovered yep. by each other. Mm -hmm. And it corrupts both of you. And I do like that when you do our writing about a character is contaminates the other one and the other one contaminates but that's why I like a look at pizza. Yeah. You know, she's a little bit juvenile, she meets her character and she comes a little more grown up. <laughs> and then he's a little more adult and mm -hmm. when she meets him he gets a little more fun. Yeah. A little more fun and, and I think that's what they're going for because they're trying to go in for this with this movie and it just doesn't Because Elena them. also starts to make some choices that are against the rules, I guess. She starts to break the rules a little bit as the narrative goes on, yeah. only slightly in order to catch the killer because of her, her interactions where she's like spending time with him directly and he also slips up because he's more focused but again I didn't buy the romantic connection between them because I didn't oh. see the realism that was in the screenplay right and again my, he's lying the whole time in the greatest my, one of my favorite movies the Maltese Falcon the greatest flaw in that movie is the, I'm not really convinced of the love story yeah. at all but it's still a marvelous movie mm -hmm. it has a great component to the other things about it but and in that he, movie, the yeah. love story doesn't matter. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't. Because if you remove the love story from that movie, the movie is still great on its own standing. Yeah. This one focuses on this romantic entanglement. And, it just and because of it, it suffers. Yeah. Because somebody's like, I'm hopelessly romantically and emotionally involved with this person. I need to step away. And yeah. they don't want to because they really believe that they're the smartest people. Bring that out. Yeah. Bring that out. That's their, their, that is their crutch. That is the error of their ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they want to do with the book, that both of them think they're smarter than the other. Yeah. And that's how you can get discovered. I, um, would, I would like to have seen more building for the character of Paquette to Olivier Martinez, who is kind of the, the judgy cop that doesn't believe that she should have been brought in. There yeah. feels like a good like give and take to, like, he's a, he's a, dirt, he's a dirt bag. He's mean to her. He's sexist. He's... You know, he's like saying, like, you can't trust her. I think he calls her the B word. Um, like, he, he's like, he really doesn't want her there. No, but no. in that way, he respects her when she does well, and she respects him when he does well. There's a, a strained respect to everything that's being done between those two characters. Build up that guy, and then you can see the interplay of someone that she doesn't like but respects with someone that she does like but doesn't realize is the killer. Like, there, there's a little, there's ways to coast around the problems, and they just didn't coast. Right, and I think they've got a lot of inspiration from a lot of things we already cited. Mm. And then another person you want to talk about is serial killer Gary Ridgway, who had a problem with his mom. Mm. And he had, he was the Green River Killer. Oh, okay, Green yeah. River Killer, Gary Ridgway, who had mother problems. Mm -hmm. And I think if you bring, flush that out a little more, yeah, because Gina Rollins is just kind of in the movie. Just in the movie, <laughs> right. And I, she's such a she's such a big-time actress that I expected her to have a larger... Even at the age I was at, uh, I had only seen her really in The Notebook and this. And uh, so for me, I was like, I knew she was a larger-than-life actress who was capable of, of doing something unique. It's almost like when you have a, a, a murder mystery and one person's really famous, 
on like a Law and Order. Well, you're like, well, that guy's gonna be the killer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you expected guest something star, her. And then, like guest star and her or something like that. Um, that it yeah. feels like she's like again, like kind of with this movie, Kiefer Sutherland. Like they kind of put you in there with like, oh, they got the star of Twenty Four. He's our killer, right? Like that was a clever casting choice that diverted us. Gina Rollins in the film feels like, uh, uh, you know, like you know, a potted true. plant in the in, that looks really nice on screen. She doesn't have anything one. to do, and and kind of wastes the character in something that they could have done to give us more clues as an audience. Right. Especially if you do an interrogation scene, you want a little more theatrics. We know about, yeah. you know, Dark Knight. We know about Science of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. You want to do that and do a lot of exposition dumping. You want to really authentically convince me that these people can play a chess game in their mind mm -hmm. with very little dialogue and they can do the mannerisms. But if she didn't think he was the killer, then you're not smart enough. Yeah. Uh, and because and, you know we talked about uh, Lucifer with it is Elba. And yeah. He, when he he was in the interrogation room for five minutes, she goes, "It's her." And he's like, "What the <laughs> hell is her?" Because she's not lying, mm -hmm. and she hasn't told us nothing. But she's not lying, mm. and you know something like that. Yeah. Where there you got a great dialogue. She, yeah. I know, and then everybody doesn't believe her. That would be something really interesting. But I think yeah. it's just overall. I think it's just something I've seen so many times before. Yeah, there's a lot of things to the movie that we've seen done better previously and done yeah. better since, which kind of makes me... I, I think the film was stronger in my mind in 04 because it was something I hadn't seen as many of before that had done. And I see the enticement uh, for Angelina to do this movie. You get to be a character that's an FBI profiler, that's a, kind of a Sherlock Holmes kind of person that gets compromised, and then you have a big kind of a standoff ending to this it's a little course of cabin of the woods or something like that but yeah, yeah the, the ending is, is is a weird tacked on thing too because again we still don't really know like we again I need more information to believe the ending because I did she it. actually get fired like <laughs> did she actually get let go or was that a ruse in which case would they fake a phone call to fire someone for a ruse because nobody would know about that phone call like there's just details of that where it's like okay she obviously lost her job yes but yes, but is this enough of a win to make any of that worth it? <laughs> you know, explain to that kid that what the hell? Well, mommy, and daddy had a showdown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Overall, I was I was frustrated because I think this is this is just like Midnight Meat Train for me, where I think it's on the cusp of it could be great. It could be very great if you just tweaked certain elements mm -hmm. a little bit more. Uh, this is where I think. We talk about where movies are too polished. I want a little more rough cut. I think this movie needs to be really polished. Mm. I think if you do something like Hamlet and Mr. Ripley, a little more polished, a little more study of character, that this person even is a flawed character. He's really not that clever. Yeah. He just hates himself so much that he wishes he'd be somebody else. Well, and like even uh, cinematographer Amir uh, Mockery, which I hope I'm getting that right, who had worked on Man of Steel and Transformers movies, like you can see similarities in the cinematography that's on here. It's almost like uh, the team decided, let's do seven. You know, like, because they, they kind of lean into seven a little bit, but then about part way through, they're like, but let's not. And, and they change their mind because the film is not polished and it's not dirty. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, it's kind of like spilling something in your water. You know, like it kind of murks it up a little bit, but not enough. You know, it's yeah. something. Yeah, pick one side and go. And with I think it. the the murdering you know? is a little too too more clean. You want to start taking lives? You want, let's do it. This like me and I need to let's get, get, get dirty. Like, let's get dirty. Let's <laughs> you're, you're a little too much clean about this. But I uh, just said, if you did like a really good polished script, mm -hmm. you have something there. Yeah, you do. Yeah. So overall, I think the film is is disappointing. I still think it's okay. Like I, I think it's watchable. Okay. You're so nice. Um, I just think I'd rather watch a movie that does nice. that swings through the fences and misses a lot than some some movies that uh, don't try anything new and give me something a little bit more boring because of it. So I, I was entertained by enough of it. I just think like, gosh, it could have been shorter and it could have been better. Um, yeah. And I can understand. I know you're a little more softer to it than I'm going to be. <laughs> I can understand anyone who hates it too, though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but now we, want, now we want to know what you think about the film. Uh, where do you stand on Taking Lives? Um, There's not going to be a sequel. No, uh, <laughs> maybe not yet. A uh, legacy sequel, perhaps, one day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let us know your thoughts on the film. Uh, DJ Caruso is still working in the business. Do you have any other DJ Caruso films we should cover? I really like Disturbia. I dug uh, Eagle Eye. Watch those. Oh, again. the remake of Rear Window? 
Yep. Yeah. Hey, every movie's a remake of another movie. Okay. Yeah. Big Clock's got something too. Um, yes. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but let us know your thoughts on the film down below. And while you're down there as well, consider liking and subscribing. There are two free things that you can do to support the show. Yes. Um, but they also help to make sure that you never miss another episode of the show. We have episodes Mondays, Thursdays, and our other show, Scary Movie Saturdays, on Saturdays. Uh, and like Nick pointed out, go ahead and click that Patreon. If you can sacrifice a cup of coffee every single month to help independent content creators like ourselves with the show. Um, for as little as a dollar a month, you can get just quick access to the show, our Picks with Kyle and Nick show that is exclusive for patrons, yes. and you can also, at $5 and up, uh, be eligible for our rotating uh, Patreon picks that we do every single month. Patreons get to select what we talk about on the show. So, yeah. once yes. again, guys, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Kyle Gothi, I think. Uh, maybe I'm the killer, but you can find my film reviews over at gophermovies.com anyway. And I'm Nick uh, from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks. Uh, you can find that show anywhere you find podcasts, and for God's sakes, join the Patreon so we don't have to Kyle doesn't pick these kind of movies anymore. <laughs> you picked Midnight Meat Train. <laughs>